Welcome to Talk Art, where we interview artists and delve into the world of art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For registration and event information, go to the website sbos.org. Our guest is Philip Van Ornum. He is a furniture artisan, and his lifetime work has been working with his hands to create fine woodworking, inlays, and beautiful decorative veneers. He believes that we should respect wood and create furniture that will last for generations. So welcome, Philip. Thank you very much, Sally. So tell us a little bit about your earliest influences. How did you get involved with woodworking? As a young boy, I had a stepfather who had a wood shop, and he slowly introduced me to the different tools and allowed me to work with them. My sister worked in a pencil factory where she brought home the spare pieces of the slats. And I slowly started working on a scroll saw and cutting out little design features, things for gifts, things for other people. That slowly got me in into the mode of creativity and wanting to make beautiful things for other people. As I started to grow older in my elementary school years, I was introduced to art and to music where I enjoyed both and explored in both. In junior high school, I was exposed to mixed medias and clay and also got myself into an introduction to woodworking. Oh, excellent, when you're in junior high. So you started the scroll working even before junior high school. Yes, oh, I was wow. doing it at home. It was excellent. so much fun. Um, in high school, I had completed most of my classes early, so I was kind of taken under the wing of the different art teachers and also put into a regional occupation program as a cabinet maker where I spent two years, the wow. first three periods of a day, going into a cabinet shop and learning the different tools and the safety features. Oh, how lucky. Wow, high school must have been exciting for you to go to then. Some of my fondest memories from my youth was going to see my grandparents, and my grandfather always made sure that I had a model to work on. So a wooden model? Mostly? Different types of different models, types? plastic models, different things to, you know, to, to broaden my horizons into working with my hands. And I got to witness him getting the blueprints and hand carving a replica ship of the ship he was on that sank in Guadalcanal in World War II. Wow. He carved it with the utmost precision to honor the men that were lost on the USS Juno, which he survived. So he took the blueprints and designed the entire thing and you got to watch? Did well, he let you help? Oh, well, no. At the no. time it was more, you know, it was something for him and for his right. healing. But it, I got to see what doing something for a purpose and meaning behind it really was. Well, excellent. And then after high school, where did you go from there? When I got out of high school, I moved to Truckee, and I got to be an apprentice under a master there where I was doing cabinet making out of Tahoe and Truckee area where we would do many different styles and many different homes over those years that I was up there. So you did fine woodworking, like the fronts of cabinetry, things like that? Yep, you know, bars and bay windows all had built-in storage and things like that. Oh, nice. And then after that, I got to work under a furniture artisan named David Lurie, who was a true master in the art of making beautiful things in furniture. He taught me so many different things, and I learned so much from him. Um, one of the things that he taught me was the um, that you can use things like veneers, and there still is a place for them, Today, veneers have a little bit of a bad name because right. they're used in a poor manner. But when you use a veneer to get the most beauty out of a piece instead of wasting it and turning it into just a few boards, you can put those onto pieces and see them all over. Yeah, well, let's take a look. Here I have an example of a bird's eye maple. Now, if I were to go to the lumber yard and look for true thick lumber that was bird's eye, I could go through hundreds of pieces to be able to find one or two that has this beauty. Right. By creating as a veneer, which is very thin, it can then be placed upon a substrate that may be more stable than just lumber itself, like a plywood. Plywood stacks 
lumbers in different drain directions on the grain to uh, make it more stable right. and give you something that will not crack or move. So then I would be able to add the veneer to it to be able to have a beautiful, still thick piece of wood. What type of plywood do you prefer to use? Well, I like to use um, eco-friendly certified plywood, which is grown from farm grown pine where they oh, can regrow it and it's a renewable resource. So this is something that you can get at some most of your local yard, um, lumber yards, but you have to, you know, specifically ask for, you know, certified farmed lumber. I see. Of course, there are other plywoods that are made right. in other parts of the world that may not be or have been put together in that such manner. Great. It's, what, is, what kind is that? This is another veneer here. This is zebra wood. And it's an exotic wood, and it can be used, once again, on another substrate or even on the lumber itself if you want more beauty but still need um, to use solid lumber below it. So you can use, to create the veneer, you would use a beautiful piece of wood but make many la layers of veneer out of that piece of wood? Well, um, the veneers are usually made by either turning the log on a large lathe and slicing off these thin layers right. so that the most beautiful part of the tree can get the most out of it instead that of it being sense. turned to waste or only to a few boards. Instead, they'll find those most beautiful parts of the tree and then utilize them to make beautiful veneers. Very nice. Well, you have some pictures of some mirrors that you've used the veneer on. Mm -hmm. So why don't we take a look at those now? Okay. Yeah, those are beautiful. Wow. This particular one is of the zebra wood. It is the four point star mirror that I like to make. It can be hung on the square or on the diamond. You'll see that in later photos as we go through. This particular one has inlays within it of sapile and walnut, maple, all combined to make un a unique pattern around it. This is bird's eye maple, and it is the fluted shaped mirror that I make. And as you can see, there is a dramatic amount of quilting and beauty to the wood that would be hard to find if it were not for the veneer, which has taken the best piece and turned it into a large quantity. It's beautiful. And then inside you would place a mirror? Yeah, those are um, mirrors, or they can also you know, be a picture frame, picture frame. things like that, or, or for paintings. This particular one here is Sapile pomele. Where does that come from? That comes from South America. And it is a special type of cut that brings out that quilted look. With all, it almost appears to be like clouds in the wood. It has maple onlays and maple cherry and black inlays. That's beautiful. Wow. Here is the four point star mirror hung the other way where it can have a dramatic effect. Um, I like to make this mirror with two ways of being able to hang it on the back so that someone can hang it conservatively in the square fashion and then move it in a few years later and put it up in a more dramatic fashion. This particular finish is done on top of just a maple ply, but it is a tinted finish and kind of done in the fire pit fade or sunburst appeal like is done with a guitar. This one has maple onlays. It has maple and tulip wood inlays. So the reddish type of wood, what is that? That is actually a maple wood that is, maple? has a tinted a finish. Tint. Ah. So the finish has suspended color within it that I apply in layers to be able to have darker areas and lighter areas. Nice. It literally is just a white colored wood underneath it. Beautiful. Here you'll see a barbecue set in which I have inlaid in, inlays into the handles to make it a little bit classier. Oh, that's beautiful. And you brought a piece of inlay to show us in the studio how you built that. So let's take a look at that. What is it you have? Well, here is the inlay. As you can see, it is a very fine, thin piece like a veneer as well. And what I've done with those handles is I've put in a groove or a dado is the technical word for it. Dado. And then the inlay basically slides and glues into place to become one with the wood. 
that looks like an incredibly large amount of fine detail for such a small piece of wood. How do you make those inlays? That's amazing. The inlay, to be more efficient and to get the most out of the effort, is actually yes. made up <laughs> as a long board. Oh. Each of the pieces are laid in and glued up until it is one long board. And then thin slices are cut off the long board so that you can get more for your efforts. Oh, that makes a lot more sense to me. <laughs> I can get I can get hundreds instead of just one right, that I may be working on individually. And then it can be mixed into other things. A lot of times I'll mix the inlays together on like the mirrors mm -hmm. so that it's my own mixture. Oh, so secrets of woodworkers. I have <laughs> imagined this incredible amount of detail and technical work that you do, but I'm glad you have some shortcuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't call, call it a it shortcut. shortcut right. It does take a long time, but then it pays off. Instead of right. it taking me, you know, many hours to do one, right. it may take me 60 to 100 hours, but I'll get hundreds of them right. instead, and they'll be around for my lifetime to use wherever I see. Well, that's excellent. So can you tell us a little bit more about the idea of echo lumber? I know that people are concerned about... Um, rainforest destruction and tropical hardwoods disappearing. So can you tell us a little bit about how you source your wood? Well, as I was growing up, of course, there was not very many places that could say that they were certified eco lumber and they were possibly harvested in poor ways. Um, today, at a lot of the sources, you can actually ask for certified farm lumber where it might have come from or if it was farmed and replaced as a renewable resource. There were some very poor practices in long ago where people were trading entire bags, you know, entire tree was for a bag of sugar. Oh no. And so the poor indigenous people gave up their resource for something so little. But now we can demand with our dollars to have something that's more eco-friendly. Oh, excellent. And then do you get local sources as well? Yes, um, I have arborists in the area who will call me up and say, well, I have a really beautiful walnut tree or a really beautiful elm. Would you like me to turn it into rough lumber for you? And if I agree and we work it out, I'll go ahead and tell them, please turn it into rough lumber. So they'll take the, the rough tree itself and chop it up into basic large sizes. Then I can pick it up and pay for it. And then I can store it and let it dry for a year, most likely two years before I can work with it. But right. then I can talk to my customers and tell them, I know where this tree came from and I know yes. why it had to be fallen, you know, an off ramp or something, something that had to be done, right. a school expansion or something like that. So then I can tell them the place on the planet and that it was done for a real reason and now we're giving it new respect and new life, oh, something good. that will That's be beauty great. forever, beautiful forever. So you have brought some absolutely beautiful lanterns and pieces of furniture in to show us. So why don't you talk a little bit about the furniture making part of it too. Well um, in this particular case this piece here was made for one of my best clients who's a lifetime client and she came forward with a little bit of an idea of a concept of what she'd like and a little bit of a size and then kind of gave me some freedom to be able to make the interpretation of what she's looking for. This particular one has a glass top and is out of walnut and has cherry accents. I'd like to do with furniture is work with my customers if they're going to be ordering something one of a kind and handmade, they might as well get exactly what they want, whether it be shape, size, wood, style, and also things like hidden drawers, nice. safes built into furniture, those kinds of things can easily be added and put into a piece. Excellent. So how do you make the joints? I don't see any nails or holes or anything like that. How do you do that? Um, in this particular style piece, it is done all with mortise and tenon construction. Mortise and tenon is basically when a piece of wood is made as a tenon, and that tenon fits into a mortise. So the tenon becomes the joining piece and then a pin can be put through the tenon to hold it into place. Oh, very so nice. So no nails and some glue. Some glue. Yeah, but it basically is a very strong way of constructing when it's yeah, done it like to it. precise measurements. 
the strongest tenons and mortise have almost no clearance and tolerances for size. They fit in exactly. so tight. Wow. That you Excellent. can almost just put it in once with no glue. Right. And it'll stay together forever. Wow. So you brought some pictures of JPEGs of some furniture and lanterns that you've created. So mm -hmm. let's take a look at those now and you can talk a little bit more about the joint process and how that works. This is that piece that I had just talked about that we have here in studio. It has the cherry accents, which you can see a little bit in this particular shot, but it also has the cherry accent that runs around the upper rim that you can see of it as well. It's got these nice little cutouts. The, the customer said, I wanted something with some shape, but still a little bit of blockiness. And she's always been inspired by Japanese construction. So in the next photo, you can see those pins made of square dowel cherry that are used to hold those pieces into place. And a little bit more, you can see that accent that goes around the rim of the top of the table. And of course, the glass top that she wanted within it. This is a redwood lantern with electricity, electric bulb within it that can be changed to any size. It's set up to breathe, basically. So a really hot bulb will suck cool air in through those lower vents and lose the hot air out through an upper vent, which you cannot see in that particular one. It has frosted glass. This one is made out of redwood and dyed birch. It has a shoji paper within it, but it's done with modern shoji. It's still made as a Japanese style paper that is lifted out of water, dried, and pressed, but then it is plasticized on both sides so that it is flexible, is stain resistant, and also fire resistant. But you that, can still see the beautiful detail of the paper too. I really, that, that's a beautiful piece. That paper has silk within it. Oh, nice. So it has it kind of suspended within there. And that one has been in, inspired by my bike riding. I, you could see that the center is kind of the shape of a gear. <laughs> yep. Somehow it got it. inspired to, for me to do it. That is reclaimed redwood. That's redwood from the 1950s that was used as a crate that a customer came to me and said, we have this old beautiful wood we've been saving forever. Oh, nice. And I have reclaimed it to give it new life. That's a great idea. This piece is a arts and crafts style piece that is made of oak and stained dark. It is a shoe bench for when you come in the front door, you can sit down and have a place to change your shoes. Very nice. Practical too. Yeah. Excellent. So you have furniture, you have lanterns, you have veneer, mirrors, and beautiful, but you ha also have these absolutely gorgeous boxes that you've created. When I look at these boxes, you can't even see that they're different pieces of wood except for the coloring. There are no joins. It's beautifully aligned. Everything, look at this, opens up like this. And when you close it again, the lines line up. And it's absolutely beautiful. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the challenges of creating a box like this. How does that work? Well, each of the pieces of wood have to be machined and milled to exactly the same size. And then they are joined together, similar to the way the cutting board is done. And then I've staggered them on top of each other to make the checkered design. Then I've made a sliding top there that slides open, that slides on a dowel within it. That is out of maple and makore, which is a African mahogany. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So you brought some pictures of boxes too, so that we can take a close up look at those. So let's take a look at those now. This is just gorgeous. Thank you so much. The pieces that will be coming on here are shaped box. This one is a shaped box. And those are all the natural colors of the wood. And I've put them together in random style and random order to be able to utilize their and have them show each other's beauty. And with the shape boxes, no two shape boxes are alike. They can, one lid cannot fit on another, even though it might be similar in shape. They're lined with velvet. And of course, they're branded and signed on the bottom by me. 
the next image is of a wonderful box that was brought, that the idea was brought to me from the Cupertino Toyokawa Sister City organization. They have been exchanging gifts for 30 years. They're a wonderful group that helps exchange students between the two cities. And they came to me and said, we want you to come up with a great gift for our 30 year gift. And uh, the concept that I came up with was this pyramid style box. And the top is done in walnut, and that is the actual city symbol of Toyokawa, Japan. And it resides in the mayor's office for all time. Oh, it's beautiful. Very nice. What a great idea. Thank you so much. The next image is a family monogram box. Um, a family friend and the wife of a wonderful man that I have actually worked for in the corporate world for a little while, she came to me and asked for me to design and come up with a monogram with his initials. And it is something that will be handed down from father to son. The box is of walnut and the monogram is mahogany. So on, that's, that's an inlay? Well, actually that oh, particular wow, that. one, because I wanted to do it so that it would really outlast. I made it very thick. I've actually made those, you know, right. thicker than a pencil. And then I carved out the grooves and pressed it down into it. So if it had to be restanded and finished multiple times, it would always have the monogram within the top. Oh, so the letters are raised? No, on, those, on that one, they, they asked me to have it flat, but at oh. first I made it raised. Mm -hmm. I thought that the raised gave a nice three-dimensional texture and showed some shadowing, but they preferred for it to be flat, smooth. So but it's I, thick in there, not just, that's beautiful. And the grain of the wood is just gorgeous. The next shot is of it on the inside. Wow. The inside has mahogany on the inside as well, and then it has a velvet tray that has ring dividers and storage for different pieces and storage underneath it as well. So is that a mahogany veneer then? Inside? Yes, that's a mahogany veneer inside. I wanted to really show the beauty of the mahogany and the ribbon. That's a particular style of cut as well that has those nice shiny like ribbon pieces that you can see. That's oh, just beautiful. And as I said, this one will be handed down from father to son, from generation to generation wow. and tell their story. You know, exactly. Great, great grandmother had this built for great, great grandpa. It's something that is like jewelry and art. Right. This is just of me working in my shop with my branding tool. And the branding tool is something that I use to identify my pieces and it also shows the year that the piece was made. You can also see that I have the lanterns there. There's multiple little shaped boxes as well and little bottle stoppers. I do all sorts of small items to big items. I never really wanted to be pigeonholed into saying right. I'm only gonna do one particular thing. So I have lots of different things and I use this particular shot to, to show to galleries and festivals so that Excellent. they see that I do my own work. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about this style of box. That's similar to the Sister City box that you created, right? So yes. why don't you show, it, show us how that works and what this is. Well, it has a 14 degree pyramid and a 14 degree sliding dovetail lid. The lid slides up and down and will not come off. Oh, so it won't come off. Oh, very nice. Okay. Good design. The symbol on top comes from a client who is an Ironman triathlete and his wife had recently completed a triathlon in Hawaii. And so together we brainstormed and came up with the idea of the Islander sea turtle symbol, but with the Iron Man within the back of oh, the symbol. It's gorgeous. It was his way of honoring her great achievement. Oh, excellent. See, when people ask you to create these boxes, you must really get involved in their life and their stories. It's incredible because I get to be part of their love a lot of times, the love that they have for each other. And I'm willing to take the time to really pull from there their inspirations, getting their inspirations and what they're looking for. And with my knowledge and a little bit of their heart, we can come <laughs> up with pieces that are unique for anniversaries and weddings and things like that. That's excellent. In fact, um, 
w one of my anniversary boxes that I created was a customer came to me and said, I, on our 10th anniversary, we went hiking and had a picnic up on the mountains at 11,000 feet. And I picked up this little piece of wood that I really liked the shape and color of it. So he came to me just before the 20th year anniversary. Oh. And he says, I really want to design something really unique and special as a memory type of box for us. Oh, nice. And then he pulled out the stick and he said, I've been saving this for 10 years and I'd like wow. to incorporate it into the piece. So together, you know, I found out what inspired him when he was an artist and how he might have done things when he was younger. And together we came up with a piece that incorporated that. Excellent. So tell us really quickly some of the challenges that it takes. Because I know wood moves and it breathes. It's a living organism. Tell us a little bit about your challenges. How do you get it to fit so perfectly? Well, a lot of it is patience because no piece of wood is already perfect when you get it. Right. So over time, you must m machine and set aside so that every time you remove layers of the wood, it allows for the expansion and contraction that time and for the twisting of the wood to rehappen. And then when I come back to it a few weeks later, I can retrue it and come closer to perfect so that when I come to the final stage, I'm removing so little that it doesn't move at all and stays a perfectly true piece like in these the heart box where each one was made perfectly square and perfectly straight in order to create that checkered look. That's amazing. Well, the time and the effort that you put into your art is absolutely phenomenal and I have enjoyed really these beautiful boxes. I love boxes myself. So thank you for being with us on Talk Art. I'm really glad you came. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for watching our show. This is Talk Art, and I am Sally Rain.